Okay, Jay Shree and then the next one. I'm Jay Shree from the Hindustan Times. Uh, my question is again to the expert from WMO related to Joydeep's question. Um, uh, today we are seeing, if you look at the district-wise data in India, there are lots of, within one state, there are several districts with drought and several districts with excess rainfall. So the way you declare drought, uh, is it going to be only based on hydrological and meteorological parameters, or is it gradually changing, and would you have any advice on how, uh, how would you declare drought and how would it be monitored? Okay. And there was a last one behind here, I think, I believe. Yes. My question is, uh... See, uh, you know, long time back, uh, Henry Ford made a statement, you can have any car as long as, it, Model T, as long as it's black. So today, the notion is you can have any progress as long as it's development measured in GDP metrics, which is trillions of dollars of economy. My point is that unless we redefine notions of global north and global south, I really don't figure out where I'm standing. OK, hello. Excuse yeah. me. So is this my, a question? Yeah, the question is that are we willing to you know, bite the bullet on you know, owning up the crimes and genocides of the mass murders of colonialism and its dark shadows in which the United Nations itself is you know, underpinned? OK. Yeah, thank you. OK. That's, so that will be taken last. He's not a media person, so we'll start with the questions of the media people. But you didn't tell us who you are responding to, who you are asking. Okay, Mrs. Kuruma. Okay, um, let's start with, you can, you can take the questions last because you have one more to go. So let's take the others who have been asked questions. I think it's WMO. Thank you very much. I have two questions. First is about the, the climate, the time, the variability in time uh, along the, the season. So most of the, the areas in the, the planet, the Earth, that have uh, high value in agriculture are, uh, have this, uh, that one main uh, rainfall season. And uh, it's uh, critical for the, for the development of crops how the, the season is performing. Normally, there is a, with normally the forecast, the simple forecast is about uh, to make uh, averages and departures from that average. But as you know, uh, better, better maybe than us, the meteorologist, the, the rains has to fall in the right time. And that's, uh, it will be very sensitive on the, the moment that the, the, the stage of the plant development and also in the length of this, uh, this rainfall. So we need to match the crop with the, the rainfall. So from, that is, uh, from the technical side, we can forecast in, uh, with some uh, confidence at the first part of the season, there will be drier spells or not, that would be the, the impact. But uh, uh, having in mind that uh, forecast, we can exchange with uh, the farmers or the, uh, the agricultural service in order to advise on which kind of crop, which kind of variety, and especially, most important, when to seed. When that's enough uh, rain in the, at the ground, and what should be the best variety of uh, this option. It's our approach, our technical approach. You mentioned after the insurance facts. Insurance facts is uh, out of the med services, or out of the sometimes of the several government uh, stage. Could be public, could be private, but uh, is in terms of the, the contract. Sometimes the averages are in the in the contract and they are related to the premium are, are related to those uh, that that uh, specific data. So it's a matter of cooperation between uh, in, in insurance companies or governmental issue, uh, state uh, institutions and the, thing, the and farmers are a um, community of farmers. So it's something that needs to be developed and performed better. No? So it's, it's a risk. It's something that needs to be uh, shaped better. So from us, we, there is no advice. Yes, to work together and to improve the, the system is the only way. And of course, at the first stages, 
work with the technical institutions, the National Med Service, the Minister of Agriculture, in order to have the best advice at the beginning in order to uh, minimize the risk. Okay, anyone who would want to complement to that response, to those two responses? Yeah, Daniel? Yeah, I think somebody was mentioning about cooperation and how to also work on drought issues. I always keep saying, and I will keep saying it, drought is not a sector, it is a connector. We are four organizations, UNEP and many other organizations, also the Joint Research Center from the European Commission are part of the drought initiative. At least six organizations are working. This cooperation needs to be translated into the countries. In countries, the sectors should need to work together. If we, as UN organizations, work together to deal with drought, why? Because drought is not about agriculture. It's not only about environment, only about hydrology. It's about also finance. It's about health. So there are some usual suspects which work on drought, which we think that they are more relevant to drought. But drought is a national issue. So countries should need to work together, the sectors. And countries should also work together, because drought knows no boundary, political boundary. Because drought that affects Ethiopia would affect Kenya and beyond. So they need to also make some kind of south-south learning. Because countries can learn from each other better than someone working from the US or maybe Australia telling them what to do. If a neighboring country has done something, they can learn and catch up better. So we are really pushing for making countries to work together. That's why we are trying to make some kind of symbolization that we as UN agencies, we have our own specific mandates, but we also want to work together so that we try to also to, to, to make sure that we are a kind of a model. Uh, the other thing is I think there was something like a GDP and we need to translate the economics of, of drought preparedness. Drought is expensive. We need to make sure that this is translated into the policy makers also, the benefits of action versus the cost of inaction. We need to make it, make sure that Drought is not only claiming livestock and, and lives of human uh, uh, of population, but also it is uh, costing also the, the, the country, the economy itself. So there have been a number of figures that have been cited by uh, uh, many speakers, high-level speakers in the morning. So we need to really see it as a momentum, and we are always keep checking that we need to be more prepared for the next drought. We need to learn a lesson from the current drought. Thank you. OK, Ms. Samia, how do you want to complement this one? I'd like to respond I think, to the question. Um, okay. this, I think the speaker spoke eloquently, and I think he covered it all. Um, indeed, taken from the last points, or the latter points, rather, of course, drought is much more than simply not having water or, you know, or land becoming uh, useless and totally degraded. It, it is actually costing us much more to repair the damage. And it is costing us also in, in, our, the, in our human resource, our people. Because what are we doing this all for? You know, when we talk about the planet, we don't talk in isolation of the inhabitants of the, the planet, you know? So this is about our lives, our very lives and the lives of our children and grandchildren. And every generation, every generation comes with challenges and with a mission. What is the mission of this generation? We need to take time and think, what are we going to leave as our contribution to this world? And I think, like we said, mercifully, we are turning back to nature, you know? We, 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 we are thinking of sustainability. So as much as this is an existential threat, it's also, also a great opportunity to right the mistakes of the past. Huh? It is time that we mend our ways. Uh, the gentleman who spoke about, I don't know, the what can I say, maybe the quest for reparations, for uh, colonialism and, and, and all the, 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 uh, the legacy, yes, the legacy of colonialism. Yes, I think we've all recognized, I think the whole world has recognized that colonialism has been damaging to, the, to people who were 
colonized. I think we all know that. But now, now our great struggle, now that colonialism has ended, is how to get out of this new situation of, if you like, we call it neo-colonialism, meaning that we are not fully masters of our own destiny. We are not masters of our economies. And indirectly, we are not really masters of our land and the resources of our land. Now, this struggle, as all important struggles, cannot be racial alignments. We are not talking about races. White is bad, black is good. As we all know, some of our very own people are those who betray us from time immemorial. This is how slavery happened. This is how colonialism happened. You know, our own people betray us and sell us. So we are not talking about a racial war here. And we need to understand that to overcome these challenges that, as the speakers were saying, cut across nations, then automatically you need all nations. And whereas we can call out a system, we fight systems, we fight greed, you know, we, we, we fight um, excessive monopoly, but we are not fighting people because there are people in every part of the world who go who experience droughts, even in richer countries like in California recently, or I don't know where in the state, you know, in, in scarcity of resources, um, man-made or natural disasters, they, they don't discriminate. So in our struggle to overcome that and control the situation, we have to also work with everybody. Huh? We have to understand that to overcome this challenge, we cannot walk alone, <laughs> as we heard earlier today. Now, India has taught us a lot. In fact, in some of our countries, like my country in Ghana, the struggle for independence, you know, we somehow uh, mirrored it after your nonviolent uh, resistance movements. So we too, we adopted what we call positive action, you know, like um, protesting by all means, but not violent means. Um, and, and we had to go through three elections before we could get our independence. So you, you've taught us a lot. You are a great civilization. You are even a continent. You are not a country. You are, you are in a way a continent, you know? Okay. But you've managed to hold yourself together despite all the challenges. And I think India is one of the countries we look to you know, we look to, because we have similar, um, in Africa, similar patterns of, uh, or levels of development, similar challenges, and we see how you've dealt with them. And we've always exchanged notes. You know, we've always exchanged notes with you. And I don't think it's, we can always learn from each other. Yes, we will learn from you, and we will learn, um, um, and we will learn from you too. But that is, I believe, the basis of what we call the South-South cooperation, which incidentally is part and parcel of our Pan-Africanist philosophy and ideology, is that you work with all nations which are going through or have gone through the same levels of, um, of, of the same challenges as you have. And if the south of the world takes its rightful place, I think we will be able to bring about peace, contribute to peace in the globe. So the, the, the struggle to reclaim our land, to control our land, to treat our land in a humane way, is also the struggle to collaborate with all countries but specifically South-South cooperation. So we have a lot to learn from each other, and that will 
will go okay. on happening. Okay. As for the feminization of, uh, of drought, did you say? Of agriculture. Uh, you see, uh, in our countries, there is no doubt that the agricultural force in rural communities is mainly women. Without even looking at the statistics, go and tour our rural uh, communities. You will see it with your own eyes. You don't even have to check the stats. You will see it, the women. Smallholder farmers cultivating small pieces of land, it's women. Uh, trying to get water for cultivation and food, it's women. So food production, it's, more, it's mainly women. So we are talking about a reality that we've seen and we've experienced ourselves. So it will be intellectually dishonest to deny that, right? Now, but by any means necessary, if we have to overcome this challenge, if it has to be feminization of this or that, we are ready because we want to control this disaster by any means necessary. Like the young lady in the other panel discussion was saying, we, we cannot give up and we will never give up, you know, because we are not just thinking of this generation. I am thinking of my children. I am thinking of my children's children. So, so be it. If it's feminization, we are ready. We are ready to be used for a good cause. You know, we are ready, we are fully ready to be used uh, for a good cause. And I want to reiterate this. Nothing changes without the full engagement of the women who are the grassroots. Nothing will change. So the day I, we see change, the day you will see more women. We need more women across the board in everything, in politics, in, um, in, in, in everything. But being an activist, a political activist or what have you, I have to come back to the plea that the solution is political. The solution is political. All what we are saying and doing, all the hard work of all these people who are trying to tell us this and that and give us information, unless it's translated into policies that will impact positively on the lives of our people, then we have not succeeded. Okay. So if we are shouting, if we are talking too much, it's because there's a deficit in pro-people policies, in pro-land policies. Thank okay, you. thank you. I think there are some technical questions still that were asked that have not been answered. It was, yeah? There was, um, I, I don't know how technical that question was, but uh, there was a question here from the Global News Network, from Nirita. Thank you for asking that about um, climate change, its impact, and those impacted and how, um, how really the lifestyle changes can come in. And I think you're touching on a very important point, and um, I'd like to draw the attention to the sustainable development and goal framework there. We have a goal of res responsible consumption and production, and the innovation of the sustainable development goals is that they're not only for the so-called developing countries, but they also target the so-called industrialized or so-called developed countries, and I think this is really something that we need to grapple with very closely. And it's not enough to think about small initiative. I think we really need to be bold and take bold action. I work for the Global Water Partnership, so our entry point is water to this equation. And if we think about, for example, the shirt that I'm wearing, the food that is waiting outside, um, the water bottle that's sitting here, but also the glass that is here, if we think about the water that has been used to produce all these goods, and our food, I think we get a very helpful way of discussing on how our day-to-day -day life is impacting water. And then at the same time, if we think about the impacts and how climate change manifests itself, it is through water. If we look at the pictures that are usually used to depict what climate change does to us, it's droughts, it's floods, it's tropical storms. So if we are better able to manage our water systems. We will be able better to adapt to climate change and we will have also, and that's often forgotten in this conversation, a huge impact in reducing climate change, so what is called mitigation. 
of climate change. If we think about the wetlands, the carbon storage that's there, the peatlands, the carbon storage that, that, that those provide to us. If we think about how water is transported from one place to the other, if we think about food production, if we think about the forest that, um, that, that are providing tremendous ecosystem service to all of us. There is a water angle to it, and I think it's a an helpful angle in order to connect the different players and to really do what the previous speaker were talking about, about thinking about the people and their day-to-day -day decisions, their management decisions, and how they can also affect very positive change, and that's where really change happens. It's in the individual actions of all of us, of all of us as individuals, and I think we need to reflect on that and reflect on our lifestyle and on what we're contributing or what we're not contributing to this. Thank you. Okay, so I'll ask the last two speakers who haven't spoken yet, Mr. Brentrup and Mansour, if they could make comments on any of the questions that were raised that you would want to respond to, so that I'll then let you go and have your short break before you come back. Thank you. Yeah. I would like to make uh, comments on three points. One is insurance. The uh, gentleman is no longer there, but um, uh, he mentioned that insurance companies are not paying because the, uh, the, the contract design does not honor that not accumulation was a problem this year, but distribution of rainfalls. Uh, just from an economic point of view, of course, the insurance company can maybe insist that this is the contract. But in the end, if the farmers are not convinced that this, uh, these insurances will help them in their problems, then the design is wrong. And then insurance companies are well, well advised to do something on a voluntary basis because they have to keep the farmers in, the, in their contract, in believing in the contract. If not, no, no farmer will pay not even a fraction of the, um, of the um, pr uh, price. Of the, um, and then the, the whole instrument, which is an important in instrument for risk reduction, will fail. So I think there must be, and then maybe in the long, longer term, it must be a, a, um, accommodated that distribution, and in the end, it is yield, income, which has to be um, um, insured. That is what is interesting for the farmer. So there must be a, a redesign maybe in the longer term. The second uh, comment is on colonialism. I happen to work in, uh, in Ethiopia, as I said. Ethiopia was not colonized, and they are proud of it. Still, they have drought problems, heavy drought problems. Germany was also not colonized unless if you take the Roman Empire. We have now, since two years, we have strong drought problems. So I'm not sure whether it's helpful in this case, not in other cases, to link both. I'm not sure about that. Um, and the, sec the third comment is on uh, sustainable uh, consumption. And yes, that is, I can only under underline uh, that, of course, is the duty mainly of the uh, industrialized countries to reduce their, consum their unsustainable uh, uh, consumption patterns. Um, there is big debate in Germany now, for example, on meat consumption, uh, flights, international flights, uh, on uh, reducing plastic use and so on. It is not easy, and I mean, you are mostly from the middle classes, and you will also understand that uh, reducing consumption in a way that is voluntary, which is uh, respected by the democratic orders and so, a political party which stands up and say, no more individual cars, you can imagine that this is, a, is not feasible in a democratic system, not, neither in Germany not in, nor in India. And so we, that is a difficult process, but I am absolutely uh, um, in uh, line with you. That is mainly a, a responsibility of the northern countries, and the SDGs are exactly there, there to, to raise this international solid, um, uh, shared responsibility. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mansour. You have the last word. Yes, uh, thank you for giving me the chance uh, to speak. Uh, I, I think uh, the answers have been provided. I just have, want to fine tune with you one point. The drought is a climatic phenomenon, it's a natural phenomenon. What is happening now is that we are seeing that they are becoming more frequent, exacerbated in areas that have not been drought prone. Uh, data has been showing that at this moment, 60% of the population suffer from water, from severe water scarcity, at least one month per year. That's four billion people that are affected by that. Now, if we look at drought as a phenomenon that's being recurrent, we have to understand how we can do to increase the resilience of the, the people suffering from drought. Uh, it's, it's affecting 
mostly those in areas that are, have traditional rain, uh, low rainfall, like dry lands. So you can imagine that variations in countries that have rainfall of 1,000 millimeters per year are different from countries that have rainfalls of 150 millimeters per year. The, the impact is tremendous. So avoiding that impact has to be done through this proactive approach. And the cost of inaction and the benefits of action are somehow described in one of these publications that I think uh, I, you would appreciate reading together with the other three publications that are launched today. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're not going to ask any second question. And also, since this was a journalist's uh, interaction, I think we would not even give you the floor, sir. But thank you so much, and I only want to appeal to the organizers that next